health is an eternal topic for mankind. We are born on earth and our health is intimately linked to the environment and ecology. The environment is the basis for human survival and development and every subtle change in the environment will eventually have an impact on biodiversity, ecosystem and our health. Exploring how the environment and ecology affect our health in the past, present and future is the mission of Eco-Environment and Health. Eco-Environment and Health is a journal initiated by prestigious scientists with a strong editorial board including multidisciplinary scientists from all over the world. With the support from EEH, you will have a better publication experience. EEH has its own offices of publishing, language, design and broadcasting. The experts will accompany you like a harmonious band and spare no effort to sublimate your valuable scientific research into a magnificent and impactful masterpiece. We have a dedicated center for decision making that deeply integrates informatics, ecology and environmental science. It explores global research hotspots, predicts discipline trends, monitors the influence and dissemination of publications and supports the journal's smart decision making. Upon receiving your submission, our assistant editors will contact you immediately and keep you informed of the manuscript status throughout the entire process. The 14-day rapid peer review will make the publication of your research one step ahead. Your distinguished work is worthy of being known worldwide. We will promote your research globally in a three-dimensional manner through various social media platforms. In addition, the open access fee will be waived for the first three years, making your research easier to be read and cited by your peers. We continue to explore and innovate the service strategy of the journal. EEH leads ecology and environment to a healthy future. Yeah. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. So, as, uh, thank you so much for the great introduction. As you heard from the introduction, I've done a lot of work in uh, epigenomics mostly to uh, understand the impact of uh, environmental toxicants on the, human, on the human body. And this is what I'm going to present today. Uh, first of all, uh, I will start with um, a provocation, if you wish. So we are exposed to many types of risk factors. And um, I don't know how the newspapers are in uh, in Asia, but here in America, anytime you open a newspaper or you just get your cell phone, there is someone who wants to tell you how to be healthier, whether it's to walk more or do meditation or making sure you get oral hygiene, drinking more water or uh, getting more nuts, less nuts, less uh, quit smoking and so on. So we're really bombarded by uh, so much information. And in general, I mean, this is not really in the public media. The Centers of Disease and Control here in the, in the United States has a document that is uh, Healthy People 2020, which uh, assesses a total of uh, 1,271 objectives spanning 42 topic areas. So in order to promote health and prevent disease, you would have to worry about about 1,300 items. So imagine going to your doctor this year and for your annual exam and having to discuss with them 1,300 items. I mean, that visit will take five days. So, and this is an issue particularly important for uh, environmental health. If we move into environmental health more specifically, I mean, just in the United States, every year we have a, a huge amount of chemicals produced that it's a number I'm not even able to read, to be honest. 
I think it's in trillions. Uh, but if you divide this number by the number of people in the United States, about 300 million of us, every year there are 30,000 pounds of chemicals. Those are about 15,000 kilos, if you prefer the metric units, uh, that are introduced into the environment per person, where the environment is any type of production. I mean, the, our houses, our, uh, the places where we work, or the environment at large. So, and, and you, and there are data that show that there are hundreds of new chemicals introduced every year. It's not just the, the amount, but also the number of chemicals. So you can understand that we are in a situation where it's very difficult to know what we are exposed to. So this is where our lab enters into the picture. Um, and something I would like to also, before going into that, I would like also to mention, it's not just the variety of chemicals, but also the time. So it's uh, relatively easy to measure chemicals in our body, in our urine, in our blood today, but it's very hard to know how much we've been exposed in the past uh, week, in the past uh, year, in, especially in the past 20 or 30 years, let alone our lifetime. But I'm sure I don't have to explain that the dose is not a function of the amount of chemical, but it's also a function of time. And so disease is, a, in, in every dose-response relationship, disease is caused by the dose, which in particular time is particularly important. And currently we have no way to reconstruct past exposure, let alone lifetime exposure. And so this is where my lab come into action. What we have been doing in, in my lab is to develop life biosensors for environmental health. We call it for precision medicine, but we are really working on environmental health. The idea is that you could get a drop of blood and fingerprint any type of exposure, whether that is smoking, air pollution, diet, metabolic risk, physical inactivity, you name it. Everything we are exposed to, everything that can affect our health, can leave a fingerprint in our blood. And by using advanced molecular biology, as I will explain right after, we can detect these chemicals. And what is really important, the difference between this type of molecular epigenomic fingerprints and standard fingerprints, is that we can also go back in time. So the challenge I'm going to discuss today is whether our cells can capture our life experience, especially experience related to environmental chemicals. And of course, I mean, if we have this type of biosensors, they're not just going to capture the exposure, they will become useful also to predict the risk of future disease. So let me go a little more into this now. The, what are the molecular responses that we can use to develop new biomarkers? So Annette Peters, uh, Tim Navrot, and I just published uh, a review last year in Cell uh, where we reviewed all the different hallmarks of environmental toxicity. So environmental toxicants come in contact with our body and they might activate oxidative stress and inflammation. They might uh, change the DNA. They might uh, uh, change the microbiome, change the intercellular communication, disrupt the endocrine system, disrupt mitochondria, and also change the epigenome. So there is a whole lot that our body, um, a, lot, a lot of changes in our body that are changed by the environment that we can tap to develop new biomarkers. And you might notice that uh, when we think about this uh, type of mechanisms, we think about mechanisms, we think we are going to fish, to find, to search for a mechanism that we can target to understand the mode of action of the chemical and perhaps to prevent uh, uh, disease by targeting those molecules. What we are doing in my lab instead is to use this type of alterations to fingerprint the chemical and develop new ways to understand the level of exposure and the duration of exposure. So I'm going to start with, uh, and I'm going to focus mostly on epigenomics. The 
And I, I want to explain to you especially what epigenetic is about using a musical example. So what you see here on the left-hand side is the DNA. You can see it's a music book. The music book has a code like the DNA that encodes a, a symphony, for instance. You would have the DNA over here. You will have the phenotype over here. And you can understand how from the same music book, from the same DNA, you can get many different phenotypes. You just need to put me on the podium or let me play the violin, and you will understand how this beautiful music will be terribly ruined. Or you can think about the, the phenotype being different depending on the orchestra, depending on the conducting style, or even due to the surrounding environment, the music hall, where uh, the, the music is performed, where the symphony is performed. So this is something that in genetics, uh, we call with in different ways, incomplete penetrance, uh, variation of phenotype expression, and so on. But it really means that uh, uh, the DNA is not enough to cause disease, that the DNA is not enough to determine health. There is always, a, a, given a certain DNA, there is always a variation of outcome. And this is really important to keep in mind, but this is not yet the epigenome. If you want to see the epigenome, you need to, you would, you would have to go on stage, look over the shoulder of each of the performers, and you will see something different. You will see something more. You will see that uh, the book is still there, the music notes are still there, but most likely you will see marks like this one in pencil, that are added onto the score. They do not change the score, but they do change the way the score is performed. You can imagine how performers in their prep would, in their rehearsals, they would add marks to remind themselves how to execute a certain passage. And this is what our cells do. There are marks added, added onto the DNA that change the way the DNA is performed. And using technical terms, they change the way the DNA is expressed. And particularly uh, in epigenetic and music, we can think about two types of markings. Markings in ink that are permanent and marking in pencil that are uh, instead erasable. They can be erased and reapplied very quickly. And for instance, in terms of epigenetics, there are uh, this is mostly depending on the type of genes. So there are genes that are programmed in a way that is pretty stable, and genes that instead are much more variable. For instance, uh, uh, when we, during embryo life, uh, the zygote gets uh, split in many cells, and the zygote, of course, is one cell, but then it has to become uh, all the tissues we have in our body. It has to become brain, eyes, skin, muscle, and so the muscle will have the muscle genes expressed and will not express the brain genes and vice versa. All of this is controlled by epigenetics and these epigenetic marks are in ink. They are permanent. It's very hard to change the programming of these type of genes. We can do that today in a, in a lab, but during our life it's very hard that a muscle cell decides suddenly to produce brain genes and to stop producing muscle genes. So these are all in ink. And then there are those in pencil that can be erased. The typical ones are the ones in our immune system, inflammation. Cytokines are very quick. I mean, our immune system needs to patrol our bodies and it needs to act very, very quick. So for instance, if there is a virus, um, the immune cells would produce interleukins in a matter of minutes. And the epigenetic marks also change that rapidly. So there are changes that happen in minutes. And again, what, but the way we are exploiting this variation is very important because we can combine using data science, the data on this type of genes and the data on this type of genes, and we can reconstruct past exposures. These are helpful to look at recent exposure, these are helpful to look at past exposure. So let me 
stop here with the introduction and let's go now out of the analogy and talk about molecular biology. It's going to be a very quick and simple introduction to molecular biology. Those of you who are not into molecular biology should not worry. But um, so uh, DNA methylation is what we are talking about here. DNA methylation is a very simple chemical modification of the DNA. It's a methyl group, CH3. It is added onto the DNA. It's, it has a covalent bind, bound to the DNA, covalent link to the DNA. And usually when a gene is methylated, it is silenced. There are exceptions to that, but mostly DNA methylation silences genes. This is particularly important. Our cells are amazing. They switch on and switch off genes all the time. Um, we have 20,000 genes. Each cell usually expresses only 2,000, 10%. And each cell has to decide which is the subset that is on and which is the larger subset that is off. And this is done continuously. There are genes that are activated and, and inactivated all the time. I mean, sometimes I stop and think uh, how hard would be my life if I had to think about switching on and off all of my genes. I mean, it's amazing that how, how, how many things our body does without us having to think about it. And you can think about simpler things like breathing on and off that usually we don't have to think about it. But you can think also about genes, how genes are switched on and off, and there is a machinery that controls how the genes are inactivated and activated. So uh, the way we measure uh, DNA methylation and is by using microarrays. We can use also sequencing, but microarrays are much uh, more helpful for the type of studies we do, which are very large because they're cheaper, easier, and more consistent, and more precise, to be honest. So it's a better instrument. It hasn't yet been surpassed by sequencing, though uh, as sequencing price comes down, probably we, we will be able to get better sequencing measures. Uh, the current microarray, this, this is produced by Illumina. It's called Illumina Infinium Speed Chip Epic. The current microarray measures 850,000 methylation sites across our genome. So we have 20,000 uh, genes. So it's about 40 in average methylation sites per gene. You can see this is a very small uh, um, piece of plastic. It's really a couple of inches, 10 centimeters long. And uh, there are, in the current iteration, which is the so-called EPIC 850K, uh, there are eight slots. In each slot, you put uh, DNA, and uh, this performs the miracle of giving back a matrix of 850,000 uh, data. There are, there are uh, continuous data bounded between zero and one, so they're very easy to, to use, and they're amazing for this type of application. Um, also, I should say the amount of DNA you need is very, very small. Really, a drop of blood is more than enough. So using this type of microarray, we have done a lot of studies. And this uh, results from a consortium we worked with, uh, with um, led by Stephanie London and uh, Dr. Johannes here in the United States. We assembled 16,000 people. 16,000 blood DNA samples from 16 different studies. And we asked Ali a simple question. Does smoking change DNA methylation? It is essentially a cross-sectional analysis. But what was really mind-blowing is that those who smoke compared to those who don't had uh, differences in DNA methylation at as many as 7,000 genes. So this is about one third of the human genome. I've never seen anything being associated with so much change in DNA methylation. And that also tells you how strong of an exposure is uh, tobacco smoking and is active tobacco smoking, of course. But what was really also very interesting is that in those who quit, we saw that most of those methylation sites were back to normal levels within five years. 
And you can ask people, correct, when they quit. And usually they tell you about, they usually people remember when they decided and succeeded in quitting smoking. However, they were, what was really even more interesting is that there were changes at some DNA methylation sites that persisted even after 30 years of quitting. So these are the genes in, uh, marked in pencil. These are the genes marked uh, in pen. And that is really particularly important. We call them lifetime tobacco genes because they never seem to go back to normal. Once they are modified by smoking, they remain there forever. And that's really interesting. It really means you finally have a time machine. You can get a drop of blood, and even if someone quit 30 years ago, you can still tell whether they used to smoke or not. And you can see some of the genes have a higher methylation, some have lower methylation. And uh, this has been used to create uh, composite biomarkers uh, DNA methylation-based biomarkers for tobacco smoking. For those of you who uh, are working in genomics, these are not very different from uh, polygenic scores. It's a combination of uh, genes or multiple genes that are combined not to uh, predict disease, but to predict the past exposure or current exposure. And so uh, they use data science, usually it's machine learning, to pull out the most predictive genes that predict smoking status or other smoking phenotypes. And there are a few here that I've been listing, uh, that, that are listed, and that are, can be used to measure the status, measure the uh, amount of cigarette smoke, the duration of smoking, and so on. And I'm happy to give you the references if you are interested. So, <laughs> Inspired by what's going on in the tobacco world, we decided to go back to environmental exposures, and, and we really thought, if there are these lifetime genes, can we, really, can we create lifetime biosensors of environmental exposure? So we started with a simpler case, which is lead. Lead, as you know, it's a, it's a metal that is toxic, but unfortunately, many of us are still exposed to lead. And um, something that we had in one of the studies where we are working, which is the normative aging study, we had some very unusual measure, measures of lead, which are lead in bone. So you can see here we have patella lead and tibia lead. Um, we are not taking a biopsy. We are using x-rays. It's a very sophisticated x-ray um, type of approach that measures, uh, measures uh, lead in bone. And why is it important to measure lead in bone? It is important because the turnover of lead in bones is very slow. So lead tends to accumulate in the bones and tends to stay there. So the half-life of patella lead and tibia lead is, is about 10 years. So this predicts that, that this measures the 10 years worth of exposure, worth of past exposure. Very different from the usual measurements of lead, which is blood lead, that measures a few months worth of exposure. So um, here we had the, the perfect benchmark to create, a, a, not perhaps not a lifetime, but a long-term biomarker of exposure. And so we used DNA methylation against these 850,000 methylation sites. We created a system that is data-driven, which is uh, a system that is, uh, uses machine learning. And we had a machine learning, and particularly Elastic Net, which is a type of machine learning, identified 59 methylation sites strongly associated with patella lead, and 138 strongly associated with tibia lead. And this was work led by Elena Colicino, who's a colleague at Mount Sunny right now. She used to be a postdoc in my lab. And um, it has been really amazing to see that. And you can see that there is um, some correlation, actually not as strong as I expected, between the actual patella levels and the predictive using DNA methylation. And but what we are seeing now is that uh, perhaps this uh, lack of perfect correlation is a good thing. 
because we are seeing that when we look at the DNA methylation led bone led biomarker in relation to to uh, outcomes, for instance, cardiovascular disease, these are very strongly associated with cardiovascular disease, even more strongly so than lead itself. So what we are positing now is that these are not just uh, biomarkers of exposure, but they reflect something else. Of course, they reflect that the chemical comes into the body, that uh, uh, enters into the cell, and that it activates DNA methylation or it inactivates DNA methylation. So, um, and perhaps they also reflect uh, a response that might be adaptive or maladaptive and might contribute to disease. So probably they're much more downstream than our measures of exposure. And this is why they are not expected to be perfectly correlated. So another challenge, I spoke about time. I'll, I'm going to change gears here. I spoke about time uh, as a challenge uh, for exposure assessment. We need to go back in time to measure accurately the dose, especially if we are thinking about chronic disease. But how about um, uh, this other challenge? We measure usually uh, exposure in, um, in blood, in urine, in saliva, in other easy to obtain biofluids or tissues. But uh, what we are really interested in is the level at the target organ. If you are looking at uh, lung disease, we would be interested in exposure to lead to any chemical in the, in the lung. If you are looking at muscles, we would want to see the levels of, of the chemical in the muscles. And this, is not part this is particularly important. There are so many tissues in our body. And even better, you probably need to worry not just about the tissue, but the cell type. Um, if you're thinking about liver damage, probably we want to look at the hepatocytes or inflammatory cells in the liver. If you're thinking about brain damage, probably we want to look at neurons or oligodendrocytes or microglia. And you will be surprised, but there are at least 200 different cell types in the human body. So we are measuring uh, lead in blood, we are measuring uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals in urine or blood. And these are a proxy that is really good to have, but it's really a proxy that might be very different from what gets into the, into the tissues and what particularly affects each single cell type in our body or those 200 more cell types we have. So how do we, how can we overcome this? So in our lab, we have been working on this um, and I'm going to motivate the study we are doing with the uh, amazing work done by our colleague Shu Gao in collaboration with our lab. Shu Gao is on your time zone at Peking University, and Shu uh, um, worked in our lab for a few years, three years, I believe, if I remember correctly. And over, we have, we, we have a, an incredibly flourishing collaboration. I think we published more than 30 papers uh, together. And last year, we published this interesting paper in Nature Aging, uh, which is about the effect of air pollution on the human brain. And this is particularly important because the air pollution affects the heart, affects the lung, but there is a really new development showing that uh, air pollution causes dementia. The people who live in areas with higher air pollution have faster cognitive decline over time, or as in this study, even spikes of air pollution may make people's cognition worse. And um, here I would like to show you also another, another important uh, piece of information. If uh, we look at Alzheimer's disease and related dementia, they don't start, uh, of course, when they are diagnosed, but what is particularly worrisome and interesting is that the People are usually diagnosed when they're 70 or older, most cases when between 70 and 90. But uh, they, there are subtle changes in cognition, often undetectable, that start much earlier, probably in the 50s. But autopsy studies have shown that the typical pathological changes, the typical tissue changes of Alzheimer's, 
can be found much earlier, even in brains that are 20 year old or 30 year old. So there is consensus now to think that Alzheimer's and dementia of older people starts in our 20s or perhaps earlier. So it would be incredibly important to have a simple test to look into the brain, not here, but over here. And of course, we can't do a biopsy of the brain. Uh, there is something that especially healthy people would not allow us to do, and not even people who have dementia would, would want to do that. So how do we get to look at the cell type in the brain without having to be invasive? The way we have been doing is by leveraging knowledge about extracellular vesicles. Extracellular vesicles are a new signaling system. They are small vesicles, see over here, that are released by every live cell. Um, you might know them as microvesicles or exosomes, which are two subtypes of EVs, extracellular vesicles. I'm going to call them EVs. I'm too used to use the abbreviation. I hope you will follow me. And they are smaller than 300 nanometers. They are found in every biofluid, in uh, plasma, serum, saliva, urine, uh, cerebral spinal fluid, you name it. And uh, whatever fluid in our body has this type of vesicles. And they, they carry a cargo that is particularly interesting, including protein, messenger RNA. And for us, it's very interesting, the micro RNA. And so what we are trying to do is to use these vesicles to go into getting the information about the specific tissues. And particularly, we are interested in microRNAs. MicroRNAs are strong regulators of gene expression. They are uh, small between 17 and 24 nucleotides, they are non-coding RNAs, and they regulate gene expression at the post-transcriptional level. Each uh, microRNA can target messenger RNAs. There is some degree of specificity through which microRNAs um, target one or more messenger RNA, and they essentially shut down gene expression. They can silence gene expression very strongly. And particularly, we, we are interested in microRNAs because uh, when they are in the exosomes, they really become like a new signaling system. We always thought about the microRNAs being manufactured within a cell and within the cell changing gene expression. But now we know that they are released in these vesicles. They travel the entire body. They are taken up by distant cells. And in the distant cell, we can see uh, now the suppression typical of gene expressions. They really signal that work not much different from cytokines or hormones that are also regulators of gene expression. And uh, so just to give you an example of how we think this work, I'll, um, they might work like emails. And this is an example from one of my students who came up with the idea that, for instance, uh, you might have an email sent by the lung epithelial cells to the blood neutrophils, and perhaps the brain microglia is being copied. And this will say response to air pollution. And it would be a very kind email. It would be, dear neutrophils, as you are fully aware, during the last few days, we have been exposed to higher level of air pollution. We need your help, and uh, please see attachment. And the attachment is the cargo of microRNAs that includes instruction, instructions about what to do in this situation. So the lung epithelial cells that are exposed to air pollution will alert uh, through the EVs, the blood neutrophils and brain microglia, and transmit signals, instructions that help the, the, those cells to cope and react to air pollution. This is exactly what we think is going on. And we have um, a model that we dreamed up about how circulating extracellular vesicles may mediate the effects of environmental exposure on the brain. And, uh, and this may be, you can see that we are exposed to air pollution and perhaps metals also here. And um, some gets into the blood, most of it remains in the lung. 
and uh, there may be release of vesicles from the lung together with inflammation, inflammatory and oxidative species. And also there may be, there may be from the blood itself, there may be a pool of vesicles that come out. So there will be all these vesicles that are uh, released by multiple sources. And the colors here are meant to reflect the heterogeneity of the EVs, particularly regarding their sources. Some might come from the lungs directly, some from the blood cells, that start to uh, be alerted about uh, the level of air pollution, they start to secrete EVs themselves, some from the endothelia, some even from the brain down here. And particularly the microRNAs here may change the messenger RNA level. And we think this is in general helps sustain inflammation. A lot of the data available about vesicles is about how they operate to increase inflammation or modulate inflammation. And we think that they can uh, help uh, down the line mediate cognitive decline, uh, damage the brain and bring cognitive, about cognitive decline, or they can just be used for risk prediction as a biomarker. So this is how we think about that. And I'm going to show some data that support this model. Uh, these are data from the normative aging study. It's a cohort of about 2,000 men enrolled in New England, Northeast United States in the 60s. They were between 21 and 80 and free of chronic disease at the time. And they've been followed up with visits every three or five years up to now. And um, we started this study in 1996 when we had about 656 participants still active. And we measure uh, microRNAs in EVs from plasma collected started in 1996 up to 2015. And the reason is because that is when the plasma was stored and froze. There is no plasma before 1996. We are using um, these methods, I'm not going to uh, go much in detail here, to isolate uh, um, EVs from plasma in this case. And we used sequencing to detect microRNAs. And we found 381 microRNAs detected in at least 70 samples. Um, to date, there are about 2,000 known microRNAs. And these are the ones that can be found in vesicles in plasma. And the research questions we had are, are plasma EV microRNAs associated with cognitive function in a cohort of cognitively normal men, and they saw could they play a mechanistic role. And so we used the mini mental state examination. It's a test of global cognition. And uh, it measures different, uh, it, 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 it asks different questions, and in general, it has a score ranging from 0 to 30. And for a specific reason, we couldn't use one question in this study because it doesn't work well in this population. So we have a score going from 0 to 21. It's a very simple tool. It's very quick to administer. It has been used a lot in large-scale population studies. So uh, we didn't look just at the cross-sectional association. We analyzed whether microRNA a baseline at the first blood sample was taken was associated with changes in cognition over time. And so we found a few microRNAs that are positively associated with cognition. So when the microRNA is, uh, is low, sorry, when the microRNA is up, cognition when is low, cognition goes down, this is the way I should say. And some were negatively associated. So when the microRNA is up, cognition goes down. And unfortunately, when we become older, cognition goes down. This is why I'm always referring to cognition going down. We don't expect cognition to go up, um, unless there is some huge training, which is unusual. And so you see that we have a lot of uh, microRNAs found with either positive or negative association. I should say that this is uh, something we call the volcano plot. It plots the p-value here, actually the negative log of the p-value, and the fold change. Sorry, the, in this case, the estimate of change. 
so these 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 are the ones that are uh, most significant on the right hand side with positive change and this is the one that is most significant with the most change in for the negative association uh, finally we know that the microRNAs belong into pathways there are, there are databases we can use to determine that and we found a lot of pathways associated with these microRNAs that were significantly associated with uh, cognition and you can see several here some are um, interesting like prion disease pathways that are important for neurology or protoglycan or adherent junction of fatty acids and so on some are more general like like glioma and some are apparently off target like leukemia for instance so uh, this suggested that there are, there are important pathways that are uh, related to the cognitive function um, and we are currently working on uh, linking air pollution to this data set so down the line probably one year from now we will be able to link air pollution evs and microRNA. so so far i haven't yet fulfilled my promise that i will tell you about specific cell types this was just a, a whole of cell types altogether it was not specific cell type but you can see, you can understand how these EVs in plasma come from all the tissues, all the cell types we have in our body. So our next step is to tease out from where these uh, EVs, these vesicles, come from. The way we do this is by using new methods. They use antibodies that bind to EVs and can pull them down, can isolate EVs. And we have we are. Uh, um, setting up antibodies that are specific for the brain. So the vesicles carry a cargo that comes from the cell of origin, but they also have proteins on the surface that are typical, uh, typical of the cell of origin, in this case, neurons. So we are using antibodies specific for neurons to isolate the vesicles that come from neurons. And these vesicles, again, are in plasma. They cross the blood-brain barrier and can be isolated in plasma. And we will have these neuronal vesicles, vesicles of neuronal origin. So we have been doing this, and this work by Howie Wu in my lab. We are uh, working on different types of cell types in the brain. We got the best results, actually, with oligodendrocytes. Uh, our first results with neurons were disappointing, but we have changed the antibody we use, and now we are also up here with neurons. And you can see we can enrich the concentration of vesicles about 80-fold. So the preparation we have has much more vesicles from neurons than, than the, the one that uh, originally we could have used. And, uh, our, and we have a 10-year plan to solve the issue of cell types. Uh, we are developing an atlas with antibodies and sequencing data for 20 different cell types in the brain, in the lung, in the heart, in the immune system, and metabolic disease. So we will have vesicles coming from all these tissues. And if you have any other cell type you are interested in studying, we can study that as well. Um, I would like just to say thank you to our team. We do a lot of work because we do it together, and uh, especially to the NIH, and uh, especially the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences at the NIH that has funded lots of our research. Finally, I would like to tell you that if you're interested in learning about this type of things, we also have online trainings that are available here at Columbia that are very short, two, three days. We teach every year an, an epigenetic boot camp we have a lot about other different uh, trainings like uh, environmental mixtures, machine learning. We have uh, also microbiome and so on. So if you want to look it up, uh, those are available. And thank you so much. I'm, I hope you were able to follow and I'm happy to take any questions.